BizQuick podcast hits on the struggles and advantages of being an entrepreneur. It's for anyone who's made the commitment to burn the boats and not look back. Are you a busy entrepreneur or small business owner trying to do it all? Then this podcast is for you. Corey and Julie will take you through the details of building a strong business. Hit the subscribe button and gear up for another episode of Biz Quick Podcast. Hello and welcome to Biz Quick. I'm Julie. And I'm Corey. And on today's show, we're welcoming back Scott Miller. We had him on really early in the BizQuick uh, Biz career. Universe? Biz, yeah, BizQuick world. And um, I just, I love Scott. Scott is amazing. Um, it is, <clears throat> the episode we had with him was probably, I think it ranks for both you and me as one of the top episodes we did. Just, it, it was such great conversation. It was probably one of the most fun conversations we've yeah. had. Scott's a really good guy. He's a 25-year Franklin Covey associate. He was their chief marketing officer and executive vice, vice president of thought leadership. He's a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He just had a new book come out called Master Mentors, which we're going to spend most of the time talking about with him. It's really great. If you haven't read it, you should pick it up. And he is an Inc.com leadership columnist, and he just recently started the Ignite Your Genius career coaching series. So Scott is kind of a do it all kind of a guy. I'm not really sure when he actually sleeps, though interestingly enough, there is a a chapter in the book that talks about that. So Wait, are you talking about the intro? Cuz he does talk about how he's No, uh, he has an interview that he does with um one of the authors and I'll find out the name of it. I'll I'll, I'll figure out who it is um where oh, Daniel Daniel Pink where he talks about where his peak performance time is. But anyway, um, on the front end here, before we bring Scott in, we're going to talk about just mentors in general. Well, before we jump into that real quick, when I was talking about the introduction. So when I, fir- when, when I first looked at the book, when you, you, know, you gave me the book to, to read and all that, and I was looking at it, kind of making my first opinion, and I was like, oh, this slacker just got like 20 people to write chapters for him, and he just published it as a book. And then I started reading it. And I was like, oh, he actually, he wrote the book and he was just telling the stories of the interviews that he had with the the people in there. But that's why I read the introduction because I was like, let me just see what this thing's all mm-hmm. about. But yeah, he, he's up at like, I think he said four o'clock every morning yeah. working and like just it, it, crazy amount of energy, crazy amount of just uh, drive that, that this guy has. And, and you'll, you'll hear it when he comes on the podcast, just, just a giant ball of energy. He really is. And he's really, his writing is very funny. It's kind of, it's kind of quippy. So I actually had the, had an early release of this book. I got the galley copy of it and had read that. And so I just, it, he's just got some funny, just little bites of information. And I'm just very curious. I, I haven't, while I have the actual physical copy of the book, once it was released, I haven't actually read that when I read the galley copy. So I'm wondering if all of those quippy kind of things stayed in there or if any of them got removed before it went to publish. Well, I guess you'll find out. Maybe. Well, when you, you're, you're suggesting I'm going to read it again? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. There are some <laughs> chapters that are definitely yeah. worth reading again. So every chapter is an interview that he did on his podcast, and he kind of lays out some key lessons that he learned, and he's got some really great people that he, you know, has interviewed for this book. But mentors. Yeah, mentors. You have some thoughts. I like to, well, okay, so first off, friends reference here. I, I like to call them mentos, you know, like Joey from Friends. But um, I think that, um, people, people, I, let me ask you a question, Corey, for someone to be your mentor, do they have to know that they're their, your mentor and do you have to have some type of a relationship with them or could, let's say Adam Carolla be your mentor? I think in my mind, in the traditional sense, the traditional definition, it's somebody that kind of, uh, and again, I don't think I, I don't never had a mentor. I don't think in like the traditional sense. Maybe, I would say maybe. Gary Walker is a mentor for you. Yeah, maybe um, he would be the the closest thing, I guess. But it's what about John Shelfo? Uh, anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> the um, ooh, what about the gin bot? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, All right, ins- are, inside joke. Yeah, references nobody else gets. Um, <laughs> well, some people will some, get them. Some people will, but anyway, the. Uh, yeah, the it, like in my mind, like the a mentor is that kind of like that apprentice setup where y- you come in, you're working, like you've got an expert, and you've got somebody that you're you want to learn 
what they know. And so you're kind of working for them with them, picking up all the, you know, the tidbits of knowledge and experience and whatever along the way. But I think that, yeah, you can definitely have somebody out there who you don't personally know who can kind of be a mentor by proxy, I guess, where if you're following, following them, you're listening to them, you're, your life is kind of being guided by them. I guess that it would be kind of, I don't say guided by them, but like you're a, a lot of what you do and you believe or whatever could be a part of maybe some of the knowledge that you got from that person. Maybe. I, so I, I think if you don't actually have a relationship with that person, I don't think you can call him your mentor, right? Like I, I will tell you very honestly, and I'm sure that, you know, a, a lot of people are probably not going to agree with this. So for a long time I was an RTA. And everybody referred to Andy, Priscilla, and Ed Milet as their mentors. And I'm like, they, with the very few exceptions, they don't even know most, most of you exist, right? They're just taking your money every month. And that, I, that probably sounds way more shitty than I mean it to. But, like, you're paying to be a part of this group and this network. The people in the group know you exist and are the ones that are really giving you more guidance and day-to-day interaction. Um, Ed and Andy show up, like, you know three times a month to talk on a, a, um, webinar and, you know, kind of distill some lessons and you can ask them some questions, but I mean, like type the question into the, you know, questions box on zoom and have them answered, but there's no interaction. And I don't think, I don't think somebody can be your mentor if everything is one way, right? Like you have to be able to engage and ask questions and, and learn. And like, I, and listen, I, I love, I love Andy Priscilla. Like I listen to his podcast. I, I, I think Andy is great and I love everything that he's done and that he's doing, but I would never say Andy Priscilla is my mentor because I don't know him and he doesn't know me. I can't I have no interaction with him whatsoever. I would say my mentor, Ernie Gilchrist, right? Now Ernie's like 80. Oh, he's probably older than 80 now, 80 years old, but Ernie taught me almost everything I know about mergers and acquisitions. And to this day, I still call him when I have business questions. Ernie is my mentor. It's a very, very clear relationship where we can speak to each other. He gives me guidance. He makes me laugh. He's a little nuts, but in the best possible way. And uh, But uh, Andy Frasilla could never be my mentor. He doesn't know me. Sure. And I, I, I would agree with you to that. We're back to kind of what I said, like in the traditional definition, it's that working under with somebody. And I, yeah, and I guess that... It, you need that personal aspect to it because I can give advice all day long on this podcast, but if I'm not actually tailoring it to a specific person, like how useful is it really? Like, you know, to say, okay, yeah, I can take kind of bits and pieces of that and apply it to myself, but the that that personal aspect, yeah, I would agree is a, a very important part of being a mentor for sure. Yeah, I, I just, okay, good. I, I kind of figured that you would agree with me. I just... I have a real problem with it, and it just kind of drives me. It drives me a little insane that people do it. I don't understand why, because I feel like it. They do it because it makes them seem important, like they have a relationship there. Do are is there guidance that Andy gives that I follow? One hundred percent. But I still would never say that's like reading a book and saying, you know, David Goggins is my mentor because I read Can't Hurt Me. Like that's that's bullshit. Like he's. He, No. So, all right, and we're going to run out of time here on the front end, but just something to think about. Maybe we can bring this up with Scott when it comes to, because you know how we like to just shit on gurus. People call themselves gurus. Mm -hmm. Do people call themselves mentors in that same fashion, like fashion that, hey, I'm a mentor for hire. Just pay me 500 (laughs) bucks a month and I'll never speak to you personally. That's a coach, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we will. Let's bring in Scott and uh, we'll see if we can get an answer to that question. All right. With so many things competing for our attention these days, efficiently acquiring and retaining customers is critical for small businesses. And that's why we launched Certivium, the newest business from the SB Pace team. Certivium is a business created specifically for entrepreneurs who need a hand with customer service, customer engagement, and social media management. We are an affordable option that any small business looking to grow needs to help maintain the most important part of their business, their customers. Find out if Certivium is right for your business at certivium.com. All right, welcome back to the show. We've got Scott Miller with us. Scott, it is so good to have you back. 
Julie, it's great to be back. What an honor. Thank you again for the spotlight. You are welcome. We, one of the, so I don't know if you know this or not. I think I sent you a message on this a while back, but Corey and I were recording some um, reels. And one of the questions we recorded was, what's the favorite podcast that you, that we've recorded? And we don't know what the other one is going to say until they're spliced together. And both of us said you. Both of us did. And I got to tell you, we had you on so early on in the process for us that um, we really still sucked a lot at doing podcasts. So be prepared for a much better experience this time, I probably sucked as a guest. I hope they have improved as well, too. So we'll see what happens today. (laughs) I highly (laughs) doubt that. So I don't, I just, I just, I, I love your energy and I, you know, really first became aware of you in the universe at, um, Rise Business Conference in, um, was it in Charleston? Charleston, yeah. 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 And you did something that no other speaker did, is that you actually went out and connected with as many people Mm -hmm. as you could Mm -hmm. that attended the conference. And I just thought that was so, it was such an interesting way to grow your network, but to also really show that you wanted to have this long lasting impact on the people that had attended that conference. And it really like, it was, it's just amazing to me. I've never seen anybody do that before, Scott. No one has said that to me about that conference. You are exactly right. It was very deliberate and intentional not to be self-serving. Obviously, you know, I'm an author and have a brand, but I really wanted to connect with as many participants kind of get a feel for why they were here and what they were hoping to learn. And I learned so much. There were chiropractors, there were physicians, there was attorneys, there were people with side hustles, there were full-time moms and parents that had a dream and a vision. So it was so helpful to understand why people were there, what was their circumstance so I could connect to it. So thank you for recognizing it. Yeah. And, you know, making the, taking that connection one step further. So that rise business conference was put on by Rachel and Dave Hollis. Yes. Yeah. And one of my favorite chapters in your book, master mentors is the Dave Hollis chapter. Wow. I, I love I Dave. Talked- and that it was, it was such a great read going through that. Oh, thank you. I thank you. I'm a big fan of both of them. They've had a rough year, right? Yeah. <laughs> a rough year yes. and a half. And yeah. uh, I stay in, I tagged, in fact, Dave and I inter- or just emailed yesterday. As a matter of fact, I, there's a lot to learn from them both, kind of what to do and what not to do, right? If you want a manifesto on how to build your brand, your business, and how to protect it from imploding, I mean, they, they actually provide an amazing, unfortunately, an amazing uh, case study and what to do, what not to do in many ways. They really do. And one of the things that, one of the reasons that that story, that particular story or interview with Dave Hollis stuck out to me so much is because... There's a statement in there that is the exact opposite of what Corey and I have been talking to business owners about since we started SB Pace. And it really made me stop to think like, huh, what are the circumstances in which this is a true statement and what we're telling people is wrong? So it was a big lesson for me. And here's this, here was this, it was the part of the story where Dave had left Disney, was working at Rise, and was that what it's called? Was it no the Hollis Co. Yeah. He's working at the Hollis, yeah, the Hollis Co. Company. Yeah. And um, Rachel sends him the email and tells him to stop acting like he's on the seventeenth floor or seventh yeah. floor, whatever it is, and to yeah. come down and talk to the people yeah. and to stop working on the business and yeah. start working in the business. And yeah. we literally are constantly trying to help entrepreneurs and small business owners get out of that yeah. the working in and start to work on so they can grow and scale. This may sound convenient, but I think you're both right. And I mean this after my own 30 year career, right? In a global company and um, being a C-suite officer myself, that constant kind of calibration, I kind of view it as a clutch and a gas for those old schoolers that have a stick car. Uh, is knowing when, when to work on the system and when to work in the system. I, I think it's more a gravitation of being on the system and knowing when to get in and then when to get out. I think one of the best books I've ever read, Julie, was a book by a man named Gordon McKenzie. He wrote a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. It basically was about his 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 professional life launching shoebox greeting cards, which is kind of the avant-garde division yeah. of Hallmark greeting cards. And Hallmark was the hairball and kind of know how to orbit the hairball, when to dip in to fix things or get resources and when to get out so you're not sucked in. So 
So I think we're saying the same thing. I think, as you said, as an entrepreneur, as a leader at any level, you need to be mindful of when to be in and when to be on. And the gravitational pull is probably to be in, but it should be to be on. But to recognize there may be times when morale is low or people are overwhelmed and the best thing you could do to build culture is to work in the system, sit down on the floor and help, you know, stuff some packets for a half an hour so that they recognize you're not above that. You understand what's happening and then get out. Don't stand there for three hours or if it's raining. And there's, you know, one of my best lessons was, can I, can I finish the story? Of course. Was I worked for George H. W. Bush, President Bush, back in 1997, 98 on his campaign for presidency. He was then the vice president. And I was an operative in the Florida office. He went on with Senator Quayle to win the presidency. And we had like 40,000 yard signs delivered to our headquarters in Orlando one Friday afternoon. You know, this is an expensive delivery, 40,000 yard signs for the entire state of Florida. And it started to rain. And the entire staff, including the state director, a guy that, you know, met with the vice president on numerous occasions in his suit, came out and helped to unload pallets before the rain started to pour down. I was 18 years old. He had more important things to do, right? Courting governors, courting senators, raising money. But he came out not just to save these paper yard signs. I mean, this was a lot of work, moving 40,000 yard signs, you know, all like wire bound onto pallets into the building so they didn't get destroyed. But also it was, a, it was a morale lifter to see the guy in his three-piece suit coming out, getting his hands all torn up, getting them all inside. And that never wore on me. Now, he didn't do it for four hours. He did it for 40 minutes. But it made me realize he understood our morale. He understood that the rain was coming. But more importantly, he wanted to build our loyalty, and I think he did. So short sto long story short, I think you stay in the working on the system, but you know strategically when to get in and when to get back out. Oh, am I allowed to talk now? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you please, <laughs> please. Yeah, tell well, us. this is a three-hour podcast, right? Yeah, the two, <laughs> and the two of y'all are going to take up about 90% of it, it seems like. <laughs> I just had a lot to say. I, was, I know. That's I, fine. There was a little gushing going on on yeah. my end. I said it. Not I'm, a, you. I'm a big fan Sorry. of Scott. Cody, please, your time is here. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the that that is a great analogy, though, or a great story because it like it it resonates with me in the sense that coming from a restaurant background, we always call those leaders who don't actually get their hands dirty clipboard managers. Yeah, they come in, they walk around, they they direct, but they don't actually do anything. And and there's a point where you shouldn't be like doing stuff, but you also, you can't be afraid to get your hands dirty. And, and that was uh, one of the, the stories in there when you, uh, was it Seth Godin, I believe, the servant leader? Um, that Bob, that really Bob hit. Whitman. Bob Whitman. Oh, Bob Whitman, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, um, uh, well, and Seth Godin had some, like the story about him where he was making breakfast for everybody as well. So maybe I got those. That was Bob Whitman also. That actually, was, yeah. All right, whatever. All we'll Bob, get to Seth Godin. It's okay. Whatever. You can share Seth Godin's Whatever. Story. <laughs> I'll just say Seth Godin one more time, get out of my system, and we'll move on to Bob Whitman. But yeah, the 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 whole point in there was the, uh, the and the same thing with, with, uh, President Bush is that at a, there's a time when you just need to get like you just need to go to work and you can't be above that work and that that really resonates with me and that was I re enjoyed those stories and then additionally your you know your story of unpacking the the pallets of uh, yard signs so thanks Cody sometimes what you're doing is modeling right you're modeling that there's nothing above your job meaning you're willing to do anything you probably shouldn't do it but you're modeling also a work ethic you're modeling that you're willing to help the army when, you know, the musket le needs to be, you know, loaded up or whatever it is. I think it's a good, it's a good balance not to get so sucked into in that you can't work on strategy systems, you know, purpose and such. Yeah. I, um, I, and I just recently saw on, I want to say, I'm pretty sure it was your social media um, I could be wrong, Scott, but I think it was you. Who, I'll take credit. It's okay. Bring it on. Who had posted that um, your two favorite. Um, yes. Yeah, that yes. was you, right? Yeah. When yes. after Bob Dole passed, you you said that mm -hmm. your, your two favorite politicians. Heroes in life. Heroes, yeah. yeah. Had now. Yeah. Had yeah. now. Um, Corey is my third hero. I mean, Corey's patience for the two of us yammering on 
shows that he's actually got the wisdom we all need to aspire to. So Corey's my third hero. <laughs> Excellent. Um, there was this quote in um, this this line in your book that stuck out with me a lot, right? Like I highlighted it. I underlined it. I tabbed the page. And it is in the section with um, Ann Chow, mm. right? Where hers, his is on, her, her entire section is on what's your motive, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was, it's an, a really interesting um, part of the book, but the, the, the sentence that I love that you have in here is, you don't get credit for doing it right, but you will certainly get penalized and worse, risk damaging a relationship if you get it wrong. Yeah. And that, um, it's, that is all about this, this, there's also the, 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 just the three words of leadership and action, which I just loved, which was another piece that I highlighted and circled and, um, just such great lessons on really understanding why we ask the questions that we ask. Right. Which is, I think if I remember correctly, what that particular part of the book was about where you said that you really had to stop and think, why am I asking that question? Um, or why, you know, what, what am I, what am I trying to gain from asking this and, and how is it perceived by the other, by the other person? It was a really, um, it, that, that, um, particular part of the book, this chapter, um, it was very different for me cause it was one that was more on the, it was definitely, but it's about leadership, but it was more about those, uh, like things that you can't really measure but things that have a significant impact on how other people feel about working with, for, and near you. The chapter you're referring to, of course, is Ann Chow. She's the first non-Caucasian, non-male CEO in at and 100 plus year history. She co-wrote a book called The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias. The story teaches a lesson through people asking her about her race, her ethnicity. But when you really understand the value of the story, is something that I'm learning later in life is how much my mindset, my experience, my background instructs the questions that I ask other people. I'm digging for information, oftentimes to use for their benefit, but maybe subconsciously sometimes to my benefit at their detriment, not intentionally or maniacally, but subconsciously. You know, most people will tell you what they need for you to know. Let me repeat that. Most people will tell you what they need for you to know. So I have become more self-aware, Julie and Corey, of balancing what is generally a good talent that I have as a leader, and that is effective question asking. I can get to the root cause of anything in four questions. I'm a trained executive, right, to be very efficient in understanding which questions I ask to get to the root cause, peel the onion, and understand what's really going on. That's a skill when it comes to, you know, reading a P&L. That's not always a great skill when it comes to building relationships and trust with others. I have to be very mindful of why am I asking this question? Is this important for me to know, to progress the relationship, to build trust with this person? Or am I just curious? Is there there some detail that I want to know because it's salacious? I'm a human, right? We all tend to be somewhat interested in that kind of thing. The chapter had a big impact on me and I'm much more mindful now of when I'm into my efficiency mindset of asking questions to people like a like almost like a, a boxing kangaroo right where i'm really good at beating someone down i should have been an interrogator <laughs> interrogators aren't great at building relationships they're great at extracting information for their own benefit the the part where you like you mentioned pnl so obviously uh i perked up a little bit over here but the the um the asking, you know, people are going to tell you what they need to know. And then asking the question, like all of that is, it's so, so important in my opinion. And obviously I would hope yours as well, but in terms of like understanding, um, what's like the root cause problems in any business, because a lot of people, they want to ask the questions that they want to know the answers to. And then you're going to get the answers that you want to hear because you're kind of, you're, you're, you have a bias in your questioning and you're not really understanding what's affecting, whether it's your customers, your team, just the business suppliers, anybody uh, in the business. And um, so like that, that's something that I I think is really important. So when somebody's trying to get to that root cause, like how do they, how do they detach themselves personally from that questioning so that they can get 
the, the correct information that they need. Corey, what a profound question. I think it's situational, meaning if I'm in a meeting and I'm working on a financial issue, right? Cost of goods issue or inventory turns or EBITDA. I'm in you know, some kind of metrics-based meeting. I'm going to be super vigilant on getting to the root cause. I'm going to ask all the questions I want answers to. And if I think you're telling me what I want to hear, my antenna is up, right? I'm going to be in a very sort of efficient mode to get the data and the facts. There's a time and a place for that. It's very beneficial. Something goes wrong in a, in a, in a, in a shipping initiative or a supply chain, and I need to know exactly where did it break down. I'm going to ask you extraordinarily piercing, maybe even like rudimentary questions. If I'm talking about something that is more aspirational, I'm building a relationship, I'm repairing some trust that is broken, I'm trying to work on the culture of the team then my questions are going to be very different. If my relationship is different with you, right? I don't have the rapport established. You can't separate. You can separate personal from professional. My entire strategy is going to be different. When I have a one-on-one -on -one with a team member, my questions are much more thoughtful, bigger, bolder, open-ended, understand what's going on in their life. How is their family? What are their dreams, their passions, their fears? Those are not the kinds of questions I'm asking in a budget review or a pipeline forecasting meeting, right? I am not Jekyll and Hyde, but I know my situation. I know my audience, and I will ask my questions in a fashion that sits the situation and the person. Um, it doesn't that, mean I'm bipolar. It just means i am got some <laughs> EQ, right? I know sure. when to ask the right kinds of questions in the right kind of setting. And just, yeah, being able to kind of detach your own personal wants and needs from whatever the, the situation is like you need to be able to no, I might be bipolar but I think it's more about me just being <laughs> sure but being able to adjust yourself to the the situation that's exactly and, right and I mean this is what this is the hallmark of great leadership right is not compromising your values but knowing you know knowing here's what I would say is there's this idea that's very popular called the golden rule right very biblical and you know, generational, treat others as you want to be treated. Hogwash, the platinum rule, treat others how they want to be treated because you can treat people differently and still treat people equity and fairly. I treat Ty different than I treat Drew. I teach, I treat Annie different than I treat Zach or Meg or Lee. I know them. I, I know what their strengths and areas of growth are. I know what, what might become emotional for them. I know what might you know tip the scales with them. So as a leader, I've paid the price to understand what is the best way to communicate with each person to maximize our relationship, the efficiency, the effectiveness, and to get the information we both need to, to win. I treat everyone differently. I try to. I it's a good that. parenting advice, right? Well, yeah, honestly. Yes. yes, and I wanna jump into uh, the one question that we were kind of talking about before. Uh, you came on because we went off on a tangent there, which is perfectly fine. But the idea of mentors, <laughs> do you need to be in person? Not necessarily in person. Does it need to be a personal relationship or could somebody like you, Scott, could you be my mentor even though that we rarely, if ever, have conversations outside of podcasts? So for the fear of, of, of risking Julie's wrath, here's my answer. You know, Harper Collins has just asked me to write a book on mentoring. I have a career coaching program called Ignite Your Genius that's become now the mentoring guide for many companies in America. And here's the answer to your question. I do not think you need to know your mentor. I've been mentored by dozens of people who do not know I'm alive. I've been reading their books. I've been watching their podcast. I've been following their radio programs. There's lots of people who have mentored me that do not know I exist. Now, I'm going to date myself. I'm 53, but there was a man back in the 80s and 90s named Bruce Williams. He was sort of the, the Larry King of the radio. He's a financial expert. And I listened to his program for 15 years every night as I went to sleep in my teens. I learned so much about, about finances and interests. I like the Dave Ramsey of the 80s, if you will, right? Bruce never knew I was alive. Seth Godin was mentoring me years before we became friends. I do think you can have mentors and not have a formal relationship. But here's the difference. That's an informal mentor. If someone is your formal mentor, then you need to ask permission. 
You need to set guardrails and boundaries. Julie, I'm thinking of opening a flower business and I need about five weeks of coaching every Monday from five to 545. Could I ask you some questions on supply chain, P&L, hiring, firing, licenses, cash flow, things like that. I won't ask you to fund my business. I won't ask you to open your Rolodex. I just want to ask you some very specific questions. That's a formal mentor. That person has said, yes, you've set some boundaries. There's a beginning and an end to this mentoring. But generally, I think it's too limiting to think that your mentor has to be someone that's on a Zoom call or sitting right in front of you, especially post-pandemic, where access to these people may not be as viable as it was because you saw the CFO in the office in the elevator every Thursday, or you met the chief marketing officer when she was in the lunchroom. I think times have changed and um, virtual mentoring and anonymous mentoring is a great way to skill yourself. And there's also, of course, enormous benefit in having a formal mentor where they know and have accepted the role and you've both set some boundaries on a beginning and an end. I'm not even going to argue with that answer because how you positioned it with the informal and the, the yeah. formal. So yeah. we're, we, we're good. Are you, I was, I had my fight face on and I didn't even need yeah. to. So um, we need to start wrapping up. I wish we didn't because I, we could talk for hours. Obviously you're such a great guest and so much, you bring so much energy. We just, and we, Corey hogged it all. Right. So I mean, Corey just <laughs> I know. Welcome, to, welcome to my world, Scott. Biz quick podcast featuring Corey. <laughs> right so before we uh wrap up is there anything that we can do for you you did you you invited me back on you gave me a chance to talk about my new book master mentors where i expose readers to 30 transformational insights from some of our greatest minds some are major celebrities and some are not and so i'm delighted to talk about mentoring get a chance to articulate my point of view on how to be a mentor and how to find a mentor i think it is a a linchpin pivot point and everyone's careers. I've had dozens of mentors, many formal, many informal. And I'm, I'll bet you, Julie and Corey, I bet you I've mentored some people formally. I have, and I bet you I've mentored some people informally that hopefully have learned from me that I haven't, you know, even been aware of. That's kind of called the circle of life. 100%. Uh, tell our listeners how they can find you, Scott. ScottJeffreyMiller.com is the repository of all things Scott Miller. You can follow me on every major social media platform, including TikTok starting in January, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and you can buy my books um, anywhere books are sold, including Amazon.com. I cannot tell you how quickly I'm going to follow you on TikTok because you are hysterical on Facebook. So I cannot wait to see what happens on TikTok. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. It was a privilege and we are so grateful that you were, gave us time again today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. We do this for you and everything about Scott is in the show notes. And if you want to work with us, reach out to us on our website and we've got a ton of free content out there. Or if you're ready to work with us, Give us a shout. We are ready to work with you. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, connect with us on social media. We've got LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, a YouTube channel, and everything you need to know about us is on sbpace.com. Don't forget to download and rate our podcast. And even better, if you feel like subscribing and giving us a written review, Corey and I love to be judged and love feedback. And if you're interested in any topics, head on over to sbpace.com and fill out the form. We are happy to oblige if we can. And while you're out there on the internet, don't forget to purchase our book. It's called Seriously Now What? A Small Business Guide to Disaster Preparedness. There is a digital workbook download available on our website. It's Our book was a number one bestseller on Amazon. And if you've already purchased the book, please rate and review it. Um, we appreciate all feedback on the book. Was that long pause because you remember that you're supposed to say bestseller I at the beginning? I said it in order and in the wrong order, <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm Julie. I'm Corey. And this was BizQuick, helping small businesses across America.